great. What a huge crowd we've got online over here. We, uh, as I say, uh, for the last few meetings that we've been trying to launch again after having a long hiatus, it is so nice to see all the support from everybody all over the world, people getting up in different time zones and all that and showing their support for the Ukraine. So we really appreciate that. And I don't know if there was anyone else that didn't introduce themselves yet that maybe was new to either an Art Talk or Dnipro Hills meeting here. Um, did I'm anyone just... else care to? Hi. <laughs> yes, please. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I'm Christina. I'm with the Geneva International Toastmasters Club. Again, another DTM. <laughs> um, but I'm very happy to come and join your meeting and to support, you know, what you do there in your Toastmasters Club and to learn from everyone here today. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, who else do we have would like to introduce, please? Uh, Nikita? Yes, I'm Nikita. I am... It's another DTM from Northern England. I'm division director for the whole of the north of England. Uh, and I'm very happy to be able to be here to support you today. Thank you so much. Um, who else? Just raise your hand here if you haven't introduced yet. Um, Adam? Uh, Jared. Oh, sorry. Fellow Toastmasters, uh, DTM Adam Khan. Mm -hmm. My home club is Burlington Advanced Toastmasters, where I'm a member with uh, Nicolina, who invited me along today. In my uh, home district of District 86, where I'm currently a division director. I also am a member of clubs in District 73 uh, in Melbourne and District 49, all of Hawaii. Pleasure to join you today. Okay, great, thank you. And I see Alicia's hand up, and did I hear a Janet maybe afterwards too, or are they the same? But Alicia first. Hi everyone, my name is Alicia Hurst, Distinguished Toastmaster and current District 100 Public Relations Manager. I'm also the newly elected Program Quality Director for District 100 and one of the first people in the world to be a remote leader pulling in from Sydney, Australia into the USA. And it's lovely to be here with you tonight from a Thai restaurant too. Great, thank you. And was there a Janet, did I hear? Yes, thank you. Uh, Janet Adams, yes, a DTM, calling in from Delaware, a member in Delaware, and also, uh, so that's District 18 and also a member of District 50, North, North Texas. Okay, great, thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Linda? Hello, I am from Burlington Advanced Toastmasters, and I'm also the president of Garden City Toastmasters of St. Catharines. Okay, great. And um, Giannis, where is he? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I'm Giannis. Uh, I'm a member of uh, Piraeus Toastmaster Club in Greece and selling speakers in, in the United Kingdom. And today I'm here with you because I'm uh, anticipating less and less uh, participation in table topics, as promised last time. Thanks for being here. Okay, great. And I see Nicolina's hand is up. Good morning, everybody. I am from Burlington uh, Advanced Toastmasters here in Canada together with Linda and Adam. And um, we are here to support you guys and uh, to enjoy your uh, early meeting. It's six o'clock in the morning. We still haven't seen the sunrise, but we are happy to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you. And who else that we haven't? Eric, uh, Eric I'd uh, like to introduce myself yes. formally. Please. <laughs> Good um, afternoon, everybody. It's Nikki Quinn, Distinguished Toastmaster from Johannesburg, South Africa. I'm a member of Copper Diem Breakfast Club in Southern Africa, which is District 74, Riverside Communicators in um, the UK, which is District 91, and Smart Speak District 114 in Nairobi, Kenya. I'm going to be the Grammarian today. I'm really glad to be here. All right, great. And anybody else? Okay, anyone else going once, going twice? All right, oh, 
think we got everybody in over here for now. Um, thank you again so much. And we have a great um, session for you today, The Power of Habit, we're gonna learn about. And um, this is a, from a, a, a very well-known person to the Toastmaster community who I personally have met several times, I think um, in, in a variety of settings. And I think you'll all have a great time. So I'm gonna turn it over to her. Paulina, please take the floor, it's yours. Thank you so much, Eric, for your introduction. Happy to be here. Happy to be Toastmaster in such a uh, tremendous, amazing meeting. I'm quite impressed. This is a true Toastmaster international meeting. We have so many people so from so many countries. Thank you for joining. Thank you for supporting us. That's, that matters a lot. That's really hard for me. Thank you for being with us today. And I have to say that it's not only Toastmasters international, but it's also Toastmasters DTM meeting, it seems, because it seems that everyone who introduced themselves or majority for sure mentioned that they are TTMs. And I see also a raised hand from Nikki. Did you want to comment something or it's from your, from your introduction? Okay, yeah, great. So great, great start. I'm looking forward to our meeting today. Let me just share with you a screen for a glance to show you our agenda and to explain the structure of a meeting for those who may be new, uh, for those who maybe is only now starting with our, uh, with our Toastmasters community. So we have a structure, a standard structure of a meeting where we will have part of prepared speeches, where we will have an interactive table topic session where anyone can have a chance to speak uh, for those who haven't been preparing in advance and will have a part of evaluation, our standard meeting. It will last for about two hours and we'll make sure to be on time. And the topic of the meeting, besides that, we have some theme that we can talk about through the entire meeting if you uh, like. And the topic uh, that was chosen is the power of habit. The power of habit is uh, about habits. Uh, those of you who once in their life or at, at this moment are trying to change their habits, please raise your hands. Who, for example, wants to introduce a good habit or remove some bad habit that you may not like. Yeah, I see some hands raised. Thank you so much. So this is a topic that sounds familiar somewhat to all of us. And I chosen, I, I have to be honest, I chose the topic, the power of habit, because it sounds nice, but it turns out there is a book with this name. It's by Charles Duhigg, and it's called The Power of Habit. And by uh, diving a bit more into this uh, topic, into this uh, idea from Charles, I realized that it's a nice thing to share. So I will focus exactly on the ideas of Charles that he's sharing in his uh, numerous presentations. For instance, I will share in the link the video from Ted, uh, Ted that you can watch after the meeting if you would like to. And so he has a book uh, written about this. So the the habits deconstructed uh, we'll talk about today. But before that, let's uh, dive into introduction of our technical team that will look at some of the aspects of our speeches today. And first one, the counter, Volodymyr Ukrainitz, I'd like to invite you to um, mention and tell about your role. Please welcome Volodymyr. Uh, thank you, Polina. Thank you. Uh, yes, my name is Vladimir, and today I'm your accountant. So my task is uh, to look for uh, such crash words like ah, mm, eh, like, you know, but, so, and so on. And at the end, I'll present my report, and uh, we'll see how you try to avoid the above mentioned crash words. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's very important role. And I will also make sure to not to use those harsh words and sounds. Let's move on. Our timer today, Natalia Baluk, please welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. I will be your timer for today. 
Now, there are a few rules that we would like, I would like to ask you to follow. First is that we have our prepared speeches, which are usually five to seven minutes. Uh, so I will be showing green card at six minutes, yellow card at six, uh, at six and a half minutes, and red card at seven minutes. Also, we have a table topic session. Usually it should last from one to two minutes. So at one minute, I will show you the green card. At one and a half minutes, I will show you the uh, yellow card. And at two minutes, I will show you the red cards. And the last part of our meeting uh, is the evaluation part. It's up to three minutes for the evaluators. So at two minutes, you will see the green card at two point uh, uh, two and a half yellow card. And then at three minutes, you will see the red card. So please try to look at my signs and be on time. So we on time with our meeting. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you so much. Thank you for keeping an eye on our time today. And let's move on. I'd like to introduce our last but definitely not least evaluator, uh, the technical expert from Marian, Nikki Queen. Please welcome. Thank you, Paulina. Hello, Toastmasters and guests. As a grammarian, it's my responsibility to pay attention to the speakers listening to their use of language. I'll take notes of any perhaps not 100% language, as well as point out some really outstanding words, phrases, and quotes, and so on. It's also, um, I'm going to introduce a word of the day. And today's word is deem. Deem means to judge, consider, or have an opinion. To use it in a sentence, you could say to somebody, I'd encourage you to reread the report and make any amendments that you deem fit. I'd encourage all of you to use that word if possible. It's D-E-E-M. At the end of the meeting, I'll give a report when I asked to do so. Back to you, Paulina. Thank you so much, Nikki. Very, very nice word, deem. Let's, let's try to use it more. I will also think about it. That's have to say it's about, about a little bit new word for me. I don't have it active in my active vocabulary. All right. Thank you. That's our technical team. And before we move to the prepared speeches, I'd like to show you the loop of the habit that Charles was showing in his uh, video on TED. How habits work. According to Charles, uh, we always pass through a certain loop when we are trying to, when we are using, when we are getting into our habit. It's some cue, some trigger signal that causes us to do some standard actions to, that trigger the habit. Then we have these routine steps that is our actual habit. Uh, for instance, um, eating junk food, you pass through McDonald's, you see a sign, that's your cue, something clicks in your head and then suddenly you are with hamburger in your hands. That's your routine. And your reward is then actual good feeling of, of this food or whatever that is. So it works with bad and with good habits in the same way. Uh, so this is, this is the loop and uh, we can work with both the cues and we can work with the rewards. So when you want to encourage a new good habit in yourself, uh, you can think about the reward that you will get when you, you will do it. For instance, if you uh, want to exercise more, you would like to do more sports, you can think about the, that you will eat chocolate after that. That's the idea that uh, Charles was uh, telling that you don't have to think about some big abstract things like, I want to be strong or healthy, that doesn't work very nicely, not always. But thinking about after my uh, jogging, after my running, I will have a piece of chocolate, that might work. That's an idea. So I will stop on that. We'll continue a bit more further with, with our meeting and let me pass the word to our first speaker today, um, our bright and prominent member of Art Talkers Club, my dear friend, Graham Seibert, with his speech called The Uniqueness of Western Civilization. Please welcome Graham. 
All right, okay, and we're back with everybody seeing the full display of who's here. I'd like to introduce myself, which I didn't before, and also introduce Eddie, who was in and out. Eddie may, may come back, so that's my son if he shows up. And also, Natalia, uh, I asked for 13 minutes for this speech, so if you could reset your timer. Four years ago, I asked Ricardo de Kinsey for a copy of his book, The Uniqueness of Western Civilization, to review. Now, when I was in college, it was deemed obvious that Western civilization was kind of the pinnacle of achievement for all of mankind, because we had uh, done just about every scientific discovery uh, throughout history. We had uh, come to dominate the 85% of the world at the turn of the 20th century. And we uh, wrote most of the books that were written. Basically, we were on top of stuff. This was received wisdom when I was a kid. Now, in the 60s and 70s, this wisdom was attacked by from many, many quarters. People said, Westerners didn't do that. No, nah, they stole it from the Indians, the Chinese, the Arabs, the Africans, and they attributed the achievements of um, civilization to everybody except us. And they had an agenda in doing this. Excuse me if you deem this objectionable, but I'm an old guy speaking, and this is an old guy's perspective, that they were they had a couple of objectives. One was to attack colonialism, whereby we uh, of European extraction had um, established relationships with countries in the rest of the world that you know, was called domination and colonialism to the benefit of us using their raw materials and holding those people back. And that was considered bad. And we were doing the same at home. We were saying, they, they said that we of European extraction held down everybody else. Um, now, there may have been some truth in this, but it was not an overwhelming truth. And it's not that every other people hadn't done it when they had the opportunity also. Anyhow, I read Dukinzi's book. I got about 150 pages into it, and he was knocking down all of these authors that I had never even read and making points that seemed to me to be pretty obvious. So I just laid the book aside and said, thank you, I'll get to that later. However, with this war in Ukraine, with us and the Russians, it all of a sudden seemed relevant, apropos, because there are different mentalities at work here between Ukraine and Russia. So I went back and revisited him. And I'd like to give you four points that he makes, and this is, these are all about the Chinese. The Chinese were a pretty inventive bunch. So first, some of these authors that he disparaged claim that the Chinese invented timekeeping. They invented a mechanical clock, which is true. They invented a water clock, which depended on gravity, pulling water down downhill, and did a reasonably good job of keeping time. Now, we in the West invented the pendulum clock with an escapement, which is not quite the same thing. It's uh, tick-tock versus drip-drip. And the tick-tock works better than the drip-drip. You can make a much more accurate clock. So the mechanism was different. But more than that, the adoption was different. We had been keeping time in the West since the Greeks and the Romans with their sundials, and we cared about it. Once the clock was invented in the West, it was used everywhere. There were clocks on church steeples all over Europe within a few decades of the invention of the mechanical clock. Whereas in China, people didn't care quite so much for time, and the timekeeping piece, time pieces just were not universally used. So that was one of his points. A second point uh, concerned um, cartography and sailing, navigation. The Europeans 
uh, started navigation with Henry the Navigator. Uh, I actually didn't start, but Henry the Navigator, king of Portugal in the first half of the 15th century, had a school for navigation at Sagres down in the south of Portugal. At the same time, a Chinese admiral took a huge fleet through the Indian Ocean to Africa. The bigger ships, more of them, more crew, but the objectives were different. The Chinese objective was to show the flag and let everybody know that the Middle Kingdom was really the acme of civilization. And having showed these people and had gotten tribute from the countries they visited, they went back to China and stayed there. Whereas the Portuguese had a commercial objective and a, an objective of spreading the Christian religion. And they put together inventions such as the caravel boat, they improved the sails, they improved the instruments to the astrolabe and so on, so they could figure out where they were. And they improved cartography so they could figure out where they had been. And they made more and more accurate maps. But perhaps what's most important, just like with the clocks, they shared their knowledge. So if some, one sailor would take somebody else's maps and go see what he saw and take notes and go back and tell the first, the, the rest of the world what he found so that the maps continued to get better and better. So this sharing was one thing that we did pretty well. The third thing was gunpowder. Now, once again, the Chinese invented gunpowder and gunpowder was um, very, very useful, but it was the Westerners who took the gunpowder and the rocketry that we got from the Chinese, used our metallurgy, metallurgy to put together better and better cannons and rifles and everything else and continued to improve the art of war. Uh, we did this through uh, techniques that are not generally recommendable, such as fighting each other all the time, but we got better and better at fighting. And another thing that the Chinese did before us was printing. They would carve Chinese characters and print on cloth and so on. And they did indeed do printing before we did. So the naysayers said, Gutenberg didn't do that. The Chinese did it. Well, let's look at what Gutenberg did that was unique. Number one, he invented movable type. So you could take the letters and rearrange them this way to write the first chapter of Genesis and then uh, rearrange them again to do Exodus, the second chapter of the Bible or anything you wanted. You couldn't do that with Chinese because their language among other things has about 20,000 characters, it's simply impossible. The other thing that was unique about Gutenberg's invention was that he used a press because Westerners had been using presses for grapes and olives for a long time. The Chinese didn't have grapes and olives and didn't have wine, so they didn't use those. And the third thing that was unique about Gutenberg was the paper. Chinese rice paper just didn't work very well for printing. It was okay for calligraphy, but it didn't work well for printing. The just happened that the paper we had in the West turned out to be pretty good. So what Gutenberg put together may not have been totally unique, but it was pretty unique. So looking at these things, and these are only four examples that I just picked out rereading Dukinzi in the last uh, couple of weeks, say, you know, we really, Western civilization really was pretty unique in these things. You look at what we did in sciences. There, the, there is no Michael Faraday. There is no Isaac Newton. There is no um, John Johann von Neumann. These people were Westerners. And it's not that they were brilliant because there are other brilliant people in the world. It's that they were um, 
curious, they were inspired, and they communicated with each other, which is perhaps the single thing that sets us apart. We in Western world uh, share our knowledge. And this is part of our Indo-European heritage, or the steppe warriors, our ancestors who came here to Ukraine, through Ukraine actually, uh, a couple of millennia ago, were people who were not so family oriented as society oriented. And we developed the habit of altruism, of taking care of one another and sharing knowledge, which is a big thing. So let me bring that into the perspective on this war. Now, Russia, starting with Peter the Great, actually before, uh, looked west and looked at Western armaments and Western uh, war fighting capabilities and copied it. Russia has always had a big army. Russia also did a little bit of invention and you can see some of their inventions on display in this war. But we in the West have this tradition of sharing ideas. And if you look at the weaponry that is flowing into Ukraine now from all over the West, it appears that the Western weaponry is more sophisticated, more versatile than what the Russians have. And that's because we share with one another. You know, NATO and you know, everybody in the West has the benefit of collective knowledge to a greater extent than Russia does. And another thing we have that is perhaps even more important is we have a collaborative way of working at war. The generals will listen to their colonels and the colonels will listen to the captains and the captains will listen to the sergeants. You get a collective, collective wisdom in how we ought to approach this. And it results in a much more effective fighting force. Russia has lost uh, a dozen or so generals in this war because the generals in a Russian army have to be very close to the front because they don't trust their subordinates to get things done. The, there, it's a very hierarchical society, always has been since the time of the Mongols. And so the orders flow down and the people down the chain don't have the authority to implement an order by, according to their own best judgment, they take judgment from the top. It doesn't work so well. And that Ukraine has surprised the world with how well it has fought, but it's Western armaments and a Western way of thinking that has set us apart. So anyhow, I'm looking forward to completing my review of the uniqueness of Western civilization because I've got a marvelous case in point as I finish the review. Paulina. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Graham. And let me remind everyone that also in the chat, you can find the Google form to leave feedback for Graham's speech. We will have about 45 seconds for filling it in. And I would, I would like to ask Natalia to time this 45 seconds and let, let her know when we are done. So. Try to be concise. Otherwise, you're deemed not to be on time with this. Time is up. Thank you so much, Natalia. By the way, you will see the raised hand of Natalia. This is made for our timer to be visible for everyone because we are a big group of people today. So that you know. Great, let's move on with our meeting and with our uh, next speech uh, from our fellow uh, member from uh, City Limits Club, uh, DTM. David Solomons with his speech, Italy, Mom and Me. I am intrigued. 
and you. Please welcome David. I'm 14 years old and I'm peering out of the small bedroom in my parents' house. And I can see the green field in at the back of my house. It's 10 o'clock in the morning on a Sunday. The sun is already rising in the sky, it's July. And already my gang of friends are gathering. Peter, Susan, Frank, they're all down there and they've got the football. Every Sunday from April through to November, we meet on that field. We play football from 9.30 in the morning until the sun goes down. Sometimes five, sometimes 10, sometimes 40 people. They come, they go all day long and they play until the sun goes down. They go for meals and some people just forget to go and their parents embarrassingly turn up on the field and drag them away. I remember there was a little kid called Daniel Kleonski from Pennsylvania and we didn't even know where that was in those days. And every week his mum would turn up and call out, Daniel, you gotta come home now. And without a moment's hesitation, an entire army of feral kids would raise their heads and say, Daniel, you gotta go home now. And off poor little Daniel would go, never learning, but always returning every single week. We were sports mad where I came from. We loved sports. We played every single sport, except that is one, tennis. We didn't play tennis. We didn't understand tennis. Tennis was a rich person sport. It was a country club sport. The only tennis we ever saw was Wimbledon on TV. And this was the 1970s. We'd had the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, Led Zeppelin, and yet tennis to us, they wore short back and side haircuts. The women's had little pleated skirts. It was another age. This was a rich country club. Not for me, not for me. I live with my mother and my father and my brother, Johnny. My father ran a ladies blouse factory that was always about to go bankrupt and eventually did. He called it Bridge Blouse Company. Dad, why did you call it Bridge Blouse Company? There's no bridge. He said, so I could tell people I work for the BBC. And he winked. My mother, there's another story. She was very ill. She had tuberculosis and she lost one and a half lungs and really couldn't breathe properly. The light in her eyes had gone out years ago. She was always in hospital and I only ever saw her at mealtimes. And I was a young teenager with, uh, with hormones to, to, to burn. So I was always out and about. And in my mind, I deemed that she watched much too much daytime television. I didn't see her much. So tennis was not for us. Until my friends, it all changed in 1972. It was July and my mother called out to me, David, come in and watch Wimbledon on the TV. Oh, I didn't want to watch Wimbledon, it wasn't for me. I wanted to play football. Oh, come in. It was so rare that she called me in that I went in. I felt guilty. I sat next to her in our little lounge area and looked at the small black and white television. Yeah, there they were. It was Wimbledon. There was the court and the people dressed beautifully and it was green and it was lovely. And then I saw something else. On one side of the court was what I expected. Short back and sides, American player. On the other side of the court was something else entirely. It was a rock and roll star. It was a tennis player with long, greasy down hair down to here. Within five minutes, he had done the best backhand I had ever seen. He then walked over and flirted with a girl in the front row. I was the age I'd always wanted to do that. And he picked the ball boy up when he fell over. I'd never seen that before. I looked at the screen to try and work out his name. Nasta, Nasta, Nasta. My friends, it was Ily Nastasi, who was the first ever Romanian world champion. 
I was glued to the screen. I looked at my mother and her eyes glistened and her cheeks were flushed. I'd never seen her like that. We couldn't tear ourselves away. Illy was wonderful, wonderful. Within an hour, I'd fallen in love with a tennis of Illy Nastasi. My mother, well, she'd just fallen in love with Illy Nastasi. I told all my friends about it and they started watching these matches as well. Every time he played, I would come in and watch with mum. We talk, we chatted. I hadn't done that for years and years. We talked about it and who would he be playing and could he win and could he possibly get to the final? Well, he won match after match after match. He got to the quarterfinals and he beat Jimmy Connors, who was the best player of his day. He got to the semifinals. We were glued to the television and he won. He won again. It was fantastic. So he was in the final on Saturday, the 9th of July, 1972. I tell you that date because it's a very special date. We were so excited. So excited. We actually got my brother and my father to join us. My father actually didn't go to work that day. We sat in front of this small TV two hours before having our meal, preparing to watch this match. And then the rains came. It poured and poured and poured with rain. And for the first time in 89 years, the final was adjourned to the Sunday. Oh, my mother turned to me. She said, darling, don't worry. We'll all watch it together tomorrow, won't we? Oh no. She'd forgotten for a moment. I couldn't do it on a Sunday. I was running in an athletics meet for my club. I don't know why. I was a terrible runner. I was the worst runner you've ever seen, except for the other runners in my club. They were awful. But I couldn't let them down. I promised. And my father said, you've got to go. So the Sunday morning dawned. And I waited outside my youth club to be picked up by a little van that was taking us all off to the run. Sitting in the back, very upset, very sad. I was going to miss the big final. I was going to miss Illy. As we're driving along, I call out to the driver. Excuse me, sir, wh where is this? Where are we running? Wimbledon. What? It turned out we were running one mile from where the Wimbledon final was. So we got to the, run it, to the running meet. And as I expected, we got knocked out in the first round. I didn't care. I still came first out of my team, but we were rubbish. We were standing outside after the meet. And a friend of mine, Michael, said, David, why don't we go up to where it is playing and we can stand outside Wimbledon Stadium and watch people go in? It'll be fun. We'll get some of the atmosphere. OK, OK. So we went up to the stadium and we stood outside and we watched all these people going in and we were trying to listen and listen. And a once in a lifetime thing happened, my friends. A man came up to me with a big hat and said, would you like to see the final? Now, I was only 14. I said, I haven't got any money. I can't, I don't have any money. He said, you don't need money. He said, just go through that door and follow the corridor. I went through the door and I followed the corridor and then I turned left and then right. And I found myself standing on center court five feet away from Illy. I looked at Illy. Illy looked at me. Okay, Illy didn't really look at me, but I did enough looking for both of us. I was there on centre court. Now, you're all thinking, David's telling us a story here, it's not true. Something happened that year that had never happened before. It rained off, as I told you. And Wimbledon, every year, they kept 100 tickets they didn't advertise in order to sell to people who turned up on the day. Now, 
back in 1972, England was a very religious country and they weren't allowed to charge for sport on a Sunday, the Sabbath. So when I turned up there, they had a hundred tickets that no one knew about and they gave me a free ticket. I was one out of a hundred. So I found myself standing watching my hero. It was amazing. It was the best match ever. It was five sets and Illy should have won. He really should have won. But he missed the drop shot on the final fifth set. I heard, read afterwards he was looking at a girl in the audience. I believe that, Italy. I'm sure that happened. And he missed it. But I was so excited. It was what a wonderful day. I couldn't believe it, even though we'd lost. And so I left there. And eventually that evening, I got home. And my mother was waiting for me because she still thought I was at the athletics. And she said, and her face was shining. Darling, darling, come in, come in. I want to tell you about the tennis. And I stopped and I thought, I've had my day. It's her day now. So I just sat down and said, OK, mum, tell me about the tennis. And she did. And, you know, to this day, Illy and I have two things in common. One, neither of us ever won Wimbledon. And secondly, my mother loved us both until her dying day. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, David. What a touching story. Thank you so much for sharing. And let's have uh, 45 seconds to fill in the feedback for David, for David's speech. I think both of our speakers would appreciate to hear the feedback from different perspectives. Maybe I can speak. Uh, we're having right now a pause for everyone to fill in the feedback. And uh, in just a few minutes, we will have a table topic session okay. where our table topic master will explain the rules. And I think you can have an opportunity to speak. Time is up. Yeah, thank you so much, Natalia. I have a strong impression that today we have a uh, area or division contest because <laughs> we have a large audience we have a minute for feeling in the feedback so <laughs> very nice thank you so much all right i am excited to, to towards our table topic session so i don't want to spend a lot of time for the, the for my talking but i will just say a few things first is i'm sending the link to the video that you can watch after the meeting if you want to the speech by Charles Duhigg. And the second thing I want to just make you think a perspective. We usually think about habits as something we do, but habits also imply they are part of our decision-making. So sometimes we make decision whether to do something or not out of the habit. And it's also important to sometimes review whether or not we're applying stereotypical thinking uh, just because we did it always like that. That's a small piece about habits. And now let's jump into our table topic session. We have lots of people and I'm sure there will be plenty of interesting questions to answer to. Uh, let me introduce you uh, DTM, member of Burlington Advanced Club, Nikolina Ivankovic, our table topic master of today. Alina, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Madame Toastmaster. It is my pleasure to be with you this morning um, and to share this uh, awesome room with so many people around the world. We are deemed uh, for a great success meeting um, and we have been deemed so far, but I'm hoping this is going to be even better with a, your opportunity to speak, which I encourage all of you to do so. So I'm gonna offer you a topic and by raising your hand, 
if in the meantime, we can have Natalia lower her hand for a little bit. So we basically don't see her hand all the time. And Natalia is going to time us and give us uh, at one minute green, at 1.30 orange, at two minutes red, um, so that we can respect the time. The first topic I would do is if you lie in a hot city in the world, what city would you choose and what would you see? If there is anybody's hand I don't see, guys, just speak up. Any maybe, city, Nikolai. Maybe I will choose some old German city, some old Gothic German city, not very big one, but I don't know what city exactly. Maybe mm, some, you know, some small town, old small town in Germany with Fachwerk, Fachwerk, uh, like, you know, this houses with uh, uh, wooden Fachwerk, Fachwerk uh, uh, walls and uh, uh, narrow streets, lots of flowers, some maybe uh, an old Gothic church in the center of the city and so on. And why are you choosing that city? Uh, because I love this style. I love old, 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 uh, old Germanian, old Germanic cities, old Germanian style. Very nice. Anything else to add, Nikolai? You good with this? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Our next question topic and try to stay in a form of storytelling. Tell us a story. And uh, it will be if you could go back in time and talk to yourself at the age of 10. At the age of 10, what advice would you give yourself? I would give myself an advice. I would tell myself what, uh, what, uh, what big mistakes I have about the mistakes which I have made since then, so that I would not make these mistakes. So I would just tell about those mistakes to myself when I was 10, so as I won't make these mistakes, maybe. Very nice, thank you very much. Okay, now I'm offering the same question to the people and I'm going to type it also here in the chat. Um, if you could go back in time and talk to yourself at the age of 10, what advice would you give yourself? There are at least three volunteers. Oh, yes. volunteers Could you go ahead, question. Apolline? I don't see all yeah. of them. Just uh, uh, call them. Yes. There was Natalie, Natalie hand raised, Graham Seibert hand raised, Nikita, and Lilia. I think the first one was Natalie, if I'm not mistaken. Thank you for such an opportunity. Uh, I will try to not to let you down. Okay. What would I tell to me when I came back, when I come back uh, uh, in time and I'm 10? I have pretty rare uh, kind of appearance as for the Ukrainian. And when I see a person in the street on a, uh, on a short glance, and I see that the person, even at least 
even uh, have a little shade to uh, resemble me, I shake because you know it's 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 really impressive to see yourself not in the window, no, not in the mirror, but on the street, the person who looks like you. And just imagine when you are 10 years old and you see the person who looks like you, but who two times, three times or five times is older than you are. How would you assume and how would you, uh, how would you look at this person? How would you, um, how would you imagine uh, to talk to that person? It is really scary. It's the first thing that I wouldn't probably like to go back in time and talk to myself. And the second thing, I remember my mom telling me when I was a teenager, so, uh, go to the school, uh, study better, and so on and so on. And what did I do? I was doing the same things I wanted to do. So I did nothing. I haven't followed her uh, advice, pieces of advice. Of course, I followed her pieces of advice, but I haven't done it in that way she wanted to. That is why I didn't want to go in past and talk to and scare myself in the past and giving pieces of advice I wouldn't follow for sure. Thank you very much, Natalie. We have here Martin and he raised his hand. Ma Martin, the same question to you. Wow, I think for a table topic, it should be another question, not the same one. <laughs> Okay, what will I do if I go back 10 years old? Um, topics masters, fellow to masters, and guests. I will, since I, I was a child, I began taking care of goats. And it was a good business for me because when they were, when I was raising them, they were growing and growing. And, and of course, it was not so easy. I should take them out to eat. And I went to school. When I returned, I should take them again to eat and all that. So it was hard. It was a lot of exercise. It was a lot of commitment. I deemed that it was an excellent business. But when they started to eat the flowers of my neighbors, I thought that I was going to be in trouble. Then I decided to, to do that in a partnership with other person who was a goat keeper. But we were going to be half and half. Half of the kids or the breeds that they were burning, they were going to be for me. And the other half, it would be for the goat keeper. But my half was being eaten by the wolf. And then my business was decreasing. When they were with me, they were going up. They were having more and more. And, but with other person, I was having less and less. So I decided to say, no, I'm not going to continue in this partnership and I must sell them. I sold them. And what I, what I must learn then, and I will tell, tell Martin as a child of 10 years old, keep your business, be a good, a goat keeper, it doesn't matter if you are a goat keeper, you will be successful as a ranch and with a, as a goat keeper. But it's never too late for you to do the things that you like. Back to you. Thank you very much for sure, Martin. It's never too late to do the things that you like. Question, if you could travel back in time to meet anyone in your family's history, whom would you most want to meet? Alicia. Thank you for that table topic question, ladies and gentlemen. I don't really care about meeting anyone in the history of my family. I care about meeting this man. 
Peter from the Olympics because he is hot and he is gorgeous and I can see the girls absolutely going crazy here on the screen. He was at the Olympics last year in 2021 at Japan. Does anyone remember him? The hot, oily, coconut driven man who walked out into the, into the main stadium. And everyone was like, wow, he is good looking. He walked out in Rio and he also walked out in London. And I thought, wow, that is the man. If anyone could have confidence, it was Peter. So I've been dying to meet this man somewhere in the kingdom of Tonga. Now, I went to Tonga back in 2006, 2007, and I did not get to meet a Peter. Has anyone met a Peter in their lives? Hands up if you've met a Peter in your lives. No. Oh, Jill has met a Peter in her life. I'm fantastic. So I need to come over to wherever Jill is located to help and meet Peter. So I don't care about meeting anyone in the history of my life. I don't care about meeting anyone else. I want to meet Peter and I want to meet him at the next Olympic Games because he is hot and he is gorgeous. The girls are absolutely laughing here and the guys are going, turn him off, take him off the screen. Back to you, Table Topics Master. Thank you very much for such a beautiful photos that inspire us to have an awesome day here on Sunday in Canada for the rest of the day. Um, I have another question. If you could be any age again for one week, what age and why you would be? Colin, this is perfect for you. Thank you very much, Madam Table Topic Master. Of course, I got so many years to pick from that you knew that that would be a challenge. Well, it's five o'clock in the morning, so this is the earliest table topic I've ever done in my life. But if I had to pick an age, I think I would pick the age of 21, because that, that was the age that you became of majority. And the world was still your oyster. So I, I think that was the year when everything was uh, a full of a promise and you could go out and you could start taking risks. And, and I think that would be the perfect time when you make up your mind that you're gonna do something, you're gonna start taking your risks and you take inc incremental steps every step of the way. Uh, 21 is also the year when, boy, those girls were looking really good. So, you know, that that guy we talked about before, he did nothing for me, but some of these beautiful girls from Ukraine, well, that's a different story. So I, I, I think everything was full of promise. Everything w w was there. So I, I think the age of 21 is probably the ideal time. You could fly to Vegas and uh, gamble for the first time and make a fortune so I wouldn't have to work for the remaining 65 years of my life. Uh, yeah, 21 is a good number. Like in Vegas, 21 means you win at blackjack. So yeah, 21 is the perfect age. And uh, I will return control to you, Madam Tabletop. Thank you very much, Colin. We all wish we are back to 21, especially with the picture this morning we got from um, our friends, Cindy, I think. Um, now, interesting question, which is down there in the chat for all the, uh, you, for all, all Toastmasters that maybe need a little bit more time to think about it. You are painting your house in pink. Tell us why you decided to do so and make a beautiful story that we all have to believe you. If I don't see your hand and you're raising your hand, just start Linda. speaking. Linda raised her hand. Hi, thank you. Well, I have a partial truth to this story. <laughs> I painted my front door pink. My house was bay, a dark taupe color. And I, actually, I'm a designer, so I have to add that in there. Making a color choice is a big deal to me. And I, at this time, I was in Saskatchewan. And Saskatchewan's not known for being colorful or creative. And I loved British decorating. And I would see sometimes in the cottages this deep, deep pink that almost a coral pink that I loved so much. And I thought, I don't care that I live in the prairies where nobody likes color. I'm painting my front door this dark coral, coral pink. And so I did that. 
And I loved it. It was warm and it was happy and it had a sense of comfort to it. When you drove up to the house, I had people stop in front of my house and take pictures of it because it was so unique. I did it for joy. I did it because I could and we need to be brave and step out and do what we love. No matter what's happening around us, you still have to be you. So that's why I painted my front door pink. Thank you. Thank you very much, Linda. So inviting so that I may think about painting the door to pink in pink. Uh, I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure that will inspire my days even more so. And my guests too. For some, maybe they think, who lives here? I will never cross the door of the woman or a person who lives with a pink door. Question. If you are to put the bumper sticker real or imagine on your car, what would that be? I can give you some suggestions. I already have, see a hand, which is awesome, but say skydiving a natural height, a protected by Smith and Wesson or something else. Nikita, go for it. I'm doing a psychology master's degree and I discovered there was an elephant in the room. Someone we were not studying was the common link amongst so many different theorists. And I eventually stumbled across him by accident by doing uh, a search outside the psychology domain. And there was actually someone who'd written in a Soviet era journal about Lev Vygotsky, a Soviet uh, psychologist, a developmental psychologist. And this is the German philosopher Hegel. His influence on psychology is absolutely pervasive. And it's reasonable to say that he anticipated psychoanalysis a hundred years before Freud. Now, the, clear, the key thing about Hegel is his dialectic. And the three elements of the dialectic are a thesis, the antithesis, and the synthesis. And the archetypal example of a dialectical struggle is the need for stability versus the need for change. Those are forever in tussle, in struggle. And so Hegel for me has become really integral to a completely new way of thinking because every single human interaction is a dialectical struggle. And this is at the individual level. It is at the group level. It is at the societal level. And for you in Ukraine, this is really relevant because the one thing that is crucial in any relationship between two people or two societies is mutual recognition. And it is the recognition of Ukraine that has been denied to you by your aggressor. So if you put, keep that in your mind, then that can empower you to remember always your own opinions truly matter, no matter what anyone else ever says. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nikita. A question. If you are uh, to have a bumper sticker on your car, think about it, what would that be? I don't know how popular it is in the rest of the world, but in Canada, we see these bumper stickers and they say, for instance, I'm a mother or children on board or um, different, different kinds, but they tell us more about the person or the family or the driver about the car, of the car. And you can completely invent your own. This is your time. Beautiful, Daphne. 
So you would put on your bumper sticker, which says your opinion matters. This is awesome. So Daphne, would you like to tell us a little bit more about it? I was actually translating what Nikita had said. I was not thinking of saying anything, but Nikita gave a fantastic story. And at the end, I was summarizing. What would you put on your bumper sticker as a result of what I just heard? Your opinion matters. And that's it. And that's it. OK. Thank you, thank you, thank you. OK. Bumper sticker doesn't sound like a very interesting to you guys, but I know what will be interesting. If you had, there's, yeah, oh, there's Vera. The, I'm sorry, the, Vera, I don't the, see the it. And it's interesting. Yes, go for it. No worries, Nicolina, thank you very much. Actually, I have, a, in my opinion, a funny story about bumper sticker that I wanted to share with you. So. For your information, I'm a driver with a lot of experience, really kind of almost 20 years, because when I was a small child, my father taught me how to drive. And I really loved that from the very first time I touched the wheel, I adore driving. So, you know, I consider myself at this point of time, an experienced driver. However, my sister wasn't driving at all. It happened so. But once I received a call from her, Vera, you know, I'm entering the school and I want to get the driving license. I was like, okay, what can I, what can I, how can I help you? And she asked me to go to the store and buy a bumper sticker with, you know, a shoe in a, with a high heel. I'm not sure if it is popular around the world, but in Ukraine, it is very popular. So it's a sticker with a shoe with a high heel showing that there is a lady driver and that maybe she's not that experienced as you want her to be. I went to the store. I was you know, confident. I'm a driver. I know where to go. I know where the part of the store is where all the driving things can be found. And I was like, OK, I just bought, buy the sticker and go home. So I was going through the store and, you know, it happened to be a very difficult task to find a bumper sticker. So I spent there a few hours, really. I didn't want to ask for help. Come on, I'm an experienced driver. So I spent there a few hours and I wonder when I was finally constantly exhausted and tired, I asked a person who was working there, would you please help me to find a bumper sticker with the shoe? I'm so tired. And I really looked like, you know, a girl that cannot drive, cannot do anything and cannot even find a sticker. And he was just like, it's here in front of you. And there were a huge stand with stickers in front of my eyes. And I just didn't notice it. <laughs> it was, I was so ashamed at this moment. So I bought the sticker to my sister and I started to think if I need to buy one for myself. So before judging, yourself, if you're experienced or not, just think another time. And maybe do not consider yourself with much of experience and try to practice more a bit on your experience. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. What a lovely story you just told us. If you want also to David uh, sorry. also raised, uh, sorry, Nicolina, David yes. also raised his hand, so that you know, yeah. David, okay, but we are going to challenge David and give him something else. Ah! <laughs> yes, it's too easy, David, this way, so let's go with this. Very similar to what we had before. If you are to make your personalized license plate, what would you put on your license plate? Oh, that's very similar. <laughs> um, well, uh, that's a good question. So about 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago, it was my birthday. And my, my then wife said to me, um, what are we going to do? And I said, well, I'm going to football with, with my son, Daniel. I'm going to Arsenal, who are my club in London. And she said to me, what time are you going to be there? And I, it's a strange question because the matches, and I told her, she said, will you be there right through the match? That was a question you never ask a football fan. I said, yes, of course I will. 
So we went to the match, my, myself and my son, Daniel, were watching the match and uh, it was a very exciting match. And then we got to half time, and I said to my son, uh, okay, I'm just going to the bathroom. He said, dad, you can't go to the bathroom. I said, what do you mean? I need to go to the bathroom. You know, it, he said, dad, dad, don't go to the bathroom. So I said, I need to. He said, okay, go really, really, really quickly. I said, I'll go as fast as like, you know how long it takes to go to the bathroom. So I raced off to the bathroom and, uh, and I, 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 I rush out, I come back, back into the stadium, back into my, Daniel's going, dad, sit down, sit down, sit down. So I said, okay, I'm sitting down, what, what's going on? And he said, look, now. And I looked up and right round the stadium, there flashed a sign that said, David Sullivan's a passionate fan, a passionate man. All the way around, 60,000 people could see it. So if I could take either a bumper sticker or a personalised, or actually I'd even be willing to put that on my gravestone, a passionate fan, a passionate man, I'd take that any time. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. And we would definitely say a passionate Toastmaster. <laughs> we would add that to describing David. How about this? If you were to be a character in a movie, who would you be? A character in a movie. One of your favorite characters in the movie you watched so far. And why? Whoever would like to speak, guys, if you... I don't see that hand. Mm. Lisa has a raised hand. Maybe. Maybe. Hard to say because when I speak about being a character, I always think about their uh, the sorrows which this character had in his life. So this prevents me to wish, prevents me to desire to be this character. But nevertheless, I think that it would be maybe, maybe it should be, you know, there is such Soviet movie, old Soviet movie called uh, that uh, that uh, called uh, that the same Munchausen. You know the story about Baron Munchausen, and in Soviet Union, uh, so in Soviet movie, there was a completely, it was completely re re reconsidered. So that Munchausen became something like a, a person who has so, so original ideas that nobody understands him. Maybe I, maybe I have some sympathies to this uh, uh, character. I cannot say that I would like to be him but it's I, I feel very sympathetic to this character. Okay. Thank you, Nikolai. All right. Alessia, are you raising your hand for next table topic? Is that why? Uh, actually, I was supposed that uh, Nikolai gave me a few minutes to um, to cover my speech about this question, but it's up to you. So I am I am ready. <laughs> You're ready. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you are giving an opportunity to live in a weird place in the world, strange place. And how about close to Grand Canyon? What would you see? What would you do? What would you feel? What would you smell? Tell us a little bit more about that experience. 
Uh, actually, honestly, once I was, um, uh, I watched a movie uh, uh, about the guy who go to uh, Grand Canyon. It was one of the movie who have some Oscar or something like that nominee, I think. And um, it was a story about how he like managed to do this trip uh, without um, um, any safety measures and when he uh, go in some trap in the grand canyon he was forced to be more than uh, 100 uh, hours without water without any connection without anything else and it was uh, it was actually um, uh, a harm uh, story because uh, he um, needed to like uh, broke his uh, arm to be able to get from the trap and only after that uh, some people saw him and uh, they like um, and he like um, he's still alive and it's real documentary is uh, it's film based on documentary story and it shows us that even in uh, such miracles as Grand Canyon we should be very safe about everything we go and about everyone um, we told about uh, all this trip and um, concerning um, to your question it's um, maybe about Grand Canyon for me it's smells like uh, something very, very unexpectedly. So I am definitely wanted to visit it, but I will be very, very careful watching on everything uh, on uh, uh, that beautiful views. And I will be very, very careful about uh, every step, even uh, every step I was doing on this land. And I hope this Grand Canyon uh, gives to me only uh, pleasant emotions, <laughs> not that uh, feeling that I have uh, watching that film. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Lancia. Madame uh, Timer, how much time is left for us for the table topics? Just checking. I think one more question will be OK, and then we will summarize it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I see Chris raise his hand. So Chris, this question. No, no, I can ask you to challenge me with, with the new one. With the new, exactly. Yeah. Oh, oh, don't worry. This is going to be oh, a yeah. new question for you. Uh, so the question to you is, you tell us a little bit about your hometown. Something we don't know about your hometown, where you are born, what did you do? What did you see? What is it that people don't know about and what town it is? Of all of the questions, uh, I had to get this one. You know, I actually was born in uh, the city I don't remember at all. Therefore, uh, let me tell you more about the city that I admire and the city that uh, that they, you know, that inspires me on, on the daily basis, Kiev. I live in Kiev and, um, you know, with uh, what transpired with war uh, since the start of, you know, the war, I, you know, I, I've been able to see my people in a new light, an unexpected light. So above anything else, about everything else, uh, I think what uh, kind of is super amazing for me is the people Ukrainians, and I haven't left Kiev, and I and I uh, really like how all the things you know the infrastructure hasn't stopped since the beginning of the war, and people uh, well, you know, the different service were doing doing their job on a daily basis, um, you know, uh, kind of fixing the is issues that definitely arose. So you know. It just is a new look that opened up for me, for, for my, my dearest, lovely uh, Kiev city. And um, I just can't stay, 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 uh, repeat this enough. I'm like super honored and super uh, grateful to uh, be living in, in, the, in the city and with people and the citizens like this here. Just nothing but respect, yeah. Thank you very much, Chris. And of course, both clubs, Dnieper Hills and the art talkers that we meet here on the weekend inspire all of us around the world to love Kiev and to love uh, your place and to be in support in every way we can. With this, I would like to close the Table Topic Master session and go back to our 
Toastmaster, right? Thank you so much, Nicolina. Let's give a, a warm round of applause to our absolutely amazing uh, table topic master with a very uh, interesting questions. I really wanted to answer all of them. And you can see now, let's say sharing her screen in the chat, you have the link to the voting for the person who answers the question that you thought was the, the best speaker of today. Uh, great, Lisa, do you want to add anything? Sorry yeah. for the information, but I did not see in the least one person, Vera Oleniva. If I'm not mistaken, she was also took part, but I did not see her. Yeah, it's, uh, it's true. I don't see her as well. Definitely put her name. No worries. <laughs> no, no, it's very significant. Thanks, uh, Volodymyr, for uh, he he's every every time he just uh, finds this <laughs> obstacle. You just need just to upload it forms, and you will see Vera in the yeah. yeah. We need to refresh the page before we will. Yeah, now now it's fixed. So please refresh the page. Please select the person who was speaking in a table topic session, and we will continue. I have about 15 seconds for that. And I will fill in the pause a little bit by telling you a bit more about the habits. Uh, but please make a choice. All right. So how do we change a habit or how we, do we introduce a new habit? I suppose, and Charles, uh, do you uh, also suppose it's the willpower that helps us to do that? That same willpower that, as you probably heard about the experiment with the marshmallow, helped children to wait for 10 minutes until not eating one marshmallow in order to get a second one if they don't eat it. That's a willpower that takes us doing sometimes not pleasant at first things, but then even receiving something bigger as a reward. And things that helping us uh, in increasing or just uh, learning uh, using the willpower that were taught, taught in, that, uh, in that video, in that uh, discussion, were actually choosing your reaction ahead of the time. So in your head, thinking about how you would do certain activity, this new habit that you want to do, uh, going for a walk or not going, for junk food instead. You're thinking about what we'll do instead when you have this attempt, when you have this cue, what you will do instead of your usual routine, what you will substitute it for, and which reward you will get for that. So for instance, instead of going for junk food, you would listen to some good music. And as a reward, you will have a pleasant feeling of that good music or you would uh, talk with your friends you just text your friends and have a call and uh, have a positive emotion by discussing something there so try to the the suggestion is that you put your willpower you put your analytical cold mind into thinking in advance how you will substitute uh, those signals those cues so when you are in a hot-blooded emotional state when you cannot control yourself that much, you already have thought it through. And this way it can be easier to change your routine, to change your habits. All right, let's move on with our agenda. Uh, and the last and very important part of our, I hope everyone already voted, if not, uh, please do so. And uh, we will move on with our agenda. Our next part is the very important learning part of the agenda is evaluations. And we will start with evaluation of grand cyber speech by member from Burlington Advanced Club, Linda Zess. Please welcome. Linda, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Well, Graham, Toastmaster Graham, thank you so much for your speech. You are 
certainly a wealth of information. And I deem that the natural timber of your voice is a real gift. I thought, Graham, that your speech was well researched. You had a lot of information. You covered a lot of topics. You're a good storyteller. You, I, I think I, I can tell that it's a natural place for you to be, uh, to have lots of information in your head and to share it. And thank you for that. That came across um, quite clearly. You had good pauses and good articulation as well. And I noticed you were really relaxed in delivering your speech. You had a lot of flow in your body, in your hands. You know, there was times your hands went up when you were talking, times they came down and spread out. I, I could tell you were connected and interested personally in what you were saying. And that really resonates, I think, when, when people are listening, when the, the speaker actually is enjoying what they're talking about. So those are the things that really uh, uh, stood out to me. Um, things that I thought that you might want to work on. Uh, because you have such a nice timber in your voice, I would like to see you use it more. Rain, increase your range. Uh, go higher when you're telling something that happened or lower and deeper. You have slight monotone at times. So I'd like to, to, to hear you extend that range. And also to a stronger ending, a str sorry, a stronger beginning and a stronger ending that tie together would have been uh, given us a, a little more cohesive feeling uh, or, or understanding when you were speaking. You had a lot of topics that you were speaking about. And I, and I thought maybe, and this could also be your challenge, pick one or two topics and narrow them down, but to, to only one or two in your speech, but then expand them more. You probably had so much great content for, I bet you, four speeches in your speech. So I think you could really uh, do a service to research and history and storytelling by giving us more of that. Uh, in in speeches where you were, were able to just expand on one or two topics, it would probably be a little bit easier to follow that way when you structure it with some simplicity in it. And I would also deem, Graham, that you'd be a great dinner guest to have. You would entertain us greatly with all your knowledge and research. Thank you so much for your speech tonight. Thank you so much, Linda, for a very nice evaluation. Thank you so much. Let's move on so that we are in time with our meeting at time agenda. The next evaluator to evaluate David's speech, I invite to this virtual stage, Timur Berejnoy, a member of Dnipro Hills and DTM. Please welcome. Hi guys, hi Paulina, thank you for a nice introduction. Um, I am really happy to be a part of this wonderful meeting with so many foreign guests. And uh, once again, I want to thank you all who are not from Ukraine, who are from other countries, that you are supporting Ukraine and you are with us now at this difficult time. And as for my evaluation, it's also a big pleasure for me to evaluate our guest from Britain, David. We heard a really great speech, very touching and personal story. And I'm going to tell, first of all, some pluses, as usual, as we usually do, what I liked about the speech. First of all, uh, David, it was a story about yourself. This is very valuable and very important, because a lot of people are telling about some other things, but uh, they are shy, maybe, to tell about themselves. Moreover, to tell some personal things, like you did, uh, very touching things, very intimate things, I would say. That's why big thanks to you for sharing with us all this and uh, your life moments so valuable and important. And um, I liked in your speech that you showed emotion. You showed like, and he won, and you, you showed it with your voice, with your gestures, with your facial expression. Not all people do this. 
and uh, this is really great and very interesting to look at. You also used visual aids, like you used Rocket when you said about tennis, it was like a milestone, so you shifted to another part of your story, and uh, visual aids really help. So if you can use some objects, it's really good. Uh, I also like your gestures, your confidence, and your energy. Energy is maybe the most important thing in public speaking because some people speak without energy. They they just speak normally, like at the kitchen with their mom. But you spoke very in a passionate way, and it touched our hearts. I'm sure of everyone here. Uh, what uh, I would like to advise to you, during all your speech, I was asking myself, where is he going? What is this all about? And fortunately, up to the end of your speech, you didn't make any conclusion. You didn't lead us to anything. Uh, maybe it was, I, unfortunately, I don't know what project that was. Uh, but uh, in our old manuals, before Pathways, we had such project as Touching Story. I believe this could be fit very well for that project, because you don't make any conclusions, you just tell a touching story. Otherwise, if this uh, is considered as a contest speech or as a general standard speech, you should make some conclusion. For example, you could have said something like, uh, it's very important to use any opportunity to achieve your goal. If you believe something is impossible, do whatever you can and miracle will happen for you. Like you got in that tennis match and met your idol, that uh, tennis is. And uh, for me, there was some excessive information in your story, which was not uh, maybe supporting the general idea. But uh, taking into account that there was no general idea, it was just a real life story, maybe it was okay, because you told us about your dad, you told us about football. I didn't quite understand the connection between all elements of your story. Uh, maybe if you would like to make it more touching, you could have said more about your mom, how you spent time with your mom and how you remember together that tennis and uh, why she loved tennis so much. You could have told, uh, told us more about this. Otherwise, uh, I enjoyed this story really much, and uh, I, I saw just uh, a piece of someone's life, a piece of something very important for another person, some things which are touching and which are interesting. So thank you for sharing that with us, and I believe I'll be able to see more of your speeches in future. Paulina? Thank you, Tim Ward. Give a round of applause to our evaluators and continue to evaluate our what extensive and yet successful tabletop session. I invite to the stage president of Dnipro Hills Club, Eric Hallowell. Please welcome. Well, thank you very much. Yes, it was um, it was quite a range that we went through in the on the questions and um, the responses. So let's get to it. Um, in terms of Nicolina's introduction, she did very well of kind of um, talking about what was going to happen and um, the the format. The only thing I didn't catch, uh, she was mentioning the word of the day, uh, to always should try to remember to put that in so people can uh, get more use of that, just remind it. Um, first speaker uh, on the question of flying in the hot air balloon. So it was uh, Nikolai answered that one and he was very direct, which is always good. He just came right out with his answer, an old Gothic German city you know, was what he wanted. And he did very good with sort of embellishing uh, language. You know, I, I caught things like houses with sort of wooden structures, narrow streets, flowers, churches. That was very good use of language. And I know obviously it's Nikolai's improving his English over there. So I thought that was a really good um, uh, process. I would say like, take a little more time. Um, like, so I, I think, um, the uh, master uh, had asked him, why did you like this at the end too? Just kind of think you should be offering that up to what, wh where does this go over here? So again, you know, intro, uh, the meat of it, and then the closing too, but otherwise good, you know, as your language is improving and definitely good with the use of the, um, the adjectives and descriptors. Um, and then that we had uh, Natalia, um, if you could go back in time and talk to yourself, um, what advice would you give? Um, and it, I really liked the way that she started this because she just sort of posed, uh, posed to us 
this scenario of seeing yourself on the street. So kind of the doppelganger introduction, which itself catches your attention. My God, there's somebody, there's me. But then kind of extended it and talked about this older person of yourself and how that leads into it and how that would be. And it was a very personalized experience of, of that. You really got into it and it was, was getting into her head of where she was taking. And then she took it to a um, concrete example of how we sort of receive in youth advice from older people in general, you know, with her mom, which is largely to ignore and go through it. We have the large, uh, you know, uh, glass of sand still is pretty full at the top and, you know, light on the bottom. So we tend not to listen as much when we we think it's not critical. We have all this time. So I think she hit on a lot of good elements over there, but I really liked her use of uh, that imagery. And then Martin uh, came and gave to the same question, his sort of theme of never too late. And he sort of did a, he did a nice technique of giving the story first of the, this major event and then came back to relay that to the 10 year old afterwards. So I thought that was another good way to handle the situation over there to, to, um, to talk about a lot of detail of a significant event and then come back to it. So I think I thought that worked well. Um, and then Alicia um, gave us her story. And she, what she did was a highly repetitive um, set of elements. You know, it was, and let me tell you about this, but it's all about Peter and then this, and it's about Peter. And so it kind of kept you going. We, it was humorous, but it also um, got you into the emotion of the moment with her and that there really isn't much else that she would do besides us. So she was honed in. And again, that repetitive element takes us through um, a, a, a lot of emotions with the speaker over there you're rooting for, you want to be able to go back and have that experience. So I thought that was really, really good about engaging the audience and with that singular purpose kind of argument. Um, and then we had another question, if you could be any age again for a week, what age would it be? And Colin um, answered that one and he opened up with humor, which is good, you know, uh, poking uh, self-deprecating humor about many of many ages to choose from based on his age. But he got sort of to a logical choice, but also kind of this critical moment where you can do everything uh, at the age of maturity, but you have your whole life ahead of you. So you have no restrictions at this point, and then you could go forward to And he added a lot of nice um, human elements, you know, girls in the human drive and full of promise and being able to gamble and win a life's, uh, you know, reward from that. So it was, it was kind of nice how he took us through that point where risk taking is there, everything is available to you. Um, and then we had Linda, who was asked about painting your house pink, and tell us why she just well, why you decided to do so. And uh, she did a really nice descriptive um, story about painting this front door pink. And she talked about um, color being so important because in other case, you know, some in the area uh, it was Saskatchewan, she talked about where that those things aren't as good, you know, kind of wanting to blend in and, and a lot of things are homogeneous, homogeneous in that. So that wanting to stand out and she talked about kind of a, a very important element was being uh, doing something just for joy, but also being brave too, that we should do things that aren't easy sometimes. And then we had uh, Nikita talking about um, on the, for what bumper sticker would it be? Um, but she was good talking about her, what she's currently doing, her passion about Hegel, um, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, dialectical struggle, all these deep thoughts over there. The only thing I would say was missing there, just kind of nail that bumper sticker slogan there. And Daphne kind of added in a little bit, your opinion matters. But that was the only thing missing was what I would have liked to heard her exact word. I just thought it was Hegel. That would have been the, but maybe that was the bumper sticker. And then Vera talked about um, her experienced driver, um, how she was an experienced driver, drove at a very young age. And this, um, I also contrasted that with her sister. And then what I liked is she went into dialogue with her sister. She actually recited some dialogue 
which kind of engages us more. This really happened in that. And this uh, quest for the bumper sticker and this, I would, I would call it like sort of journey into humility, whatever. We think we're great at doing all this stuff, but we realize, you know, look, something obvious in front of us, we didn't see. So it was done really, uh, really nicely there, but, but and um, it got us to feel and emotionalize and gave us a, a, a sort of symbolic moment there too at the end with the self-realization moment. And then um, we had David, if you are able to, uh, to make your personal license plate, would it be? I think David had his story already lined up for the, for the bumper sticker there. So, um, but he did describe an incredible story, you know, very, um, he, he put a lot of time element into it as well as to why these things were critical. We couldn't quite understand why he was being told to come back so quickly over there. So he kept seeding that. And that was very important to get the emotional message at the end of this incredible event that happened, which um, drove to his response with the passionate man, passionate fan. And so uh, I really liked the technique uh, that you use there, this planting technique and then reaping the harvest at the end. And then we had uh, Nikolai character in a movie. Um, so Nikolai, the one thing I would say is if you volunteer for a question, just don't start with hard to say. Okay. So in other words, you should have a moment where you thought it through. Otherwise don't don't offer into that. And you struggled a little bit with coming up with something, and but you did come up with the end, uh, an original man that nobody understands, which I thought was kind of an interesting uh, and daring choice to pick on, uh, pick up. And then Lysia reminded us of a movie that I think, I think it was around the canyons. I don't know if it was specifically the Grand Canyon, but I did see that movie um, of this guy that was trapped and his hand was locked in between the two stones and I remember that horrifying scene at the end where he does have to hack his own arm off it was at that time that was kind of like you know now everybody knew that was what the summary of it was but it was just so agonizing to go through so yes be prepared very good message um, for it but you also said that look you know um, I don't know what it's like there you know I don't even want to speculate, but I know it's going to be something incredible. There's going to be incredible smells there and pleasant emotions and everything um, with it. So um, you didn't do the embellishment on the story part with that, but you kind of get this anticipation and positive feel good, which was a good counter to kind of the be prepared and, uh, you know, potential downer effect of, <laughs> of what that guy went through. So you counterbalance that nicely. And then I think we closed out with um, Chris um, talking about uh, the hometown and Chris sort of turned the question at that point. So sometimes if you're posed one that you don't want to answer, you know, you kind of sit, you, you kind of set it and say, here's why I can't answer this one, but you know what, this is interesting information too. And just sort of turned it into, and he talked about really his homage to Kiev which I thought was, um, was really nice and heartfelt and a lot of the language. And you can see in the passion in his words that that was uh, really important for him to say. So we appreciate everybody uh, participating today. And we hate to say that there's only one winner, but we, don't, we have to say there is one winner right here. And that winner is Alicia with her great emphatic repetitive technique of meeting Chris. So congratulations, Alicia, well-deserved. And I turn it over to you, Paulina. Thank you so much, Eric. Congratulations, Alicia. And let's move on. I think uh, we are ready to hear the reports of our technical team. And the first report uh, where we will hear extensively about our grammar usage and the word of the day uh, is Nikki Queen. Please welcome. From Harry. Thank you so much, Paulina, Madam Toastmaster. Wow, I don't deem it necessary to give an extensive grammarian's report here of areas for improvement because I am really impressed. Most of the people here, not all, but most of the people here, English is not their first language. In fact, I suspect for many of you, it is probably your third or fourth language. I also don't want to comment on pronunciation or accent because that is not grammar. I didn't hear any 
real significant misuse of English or bad tenses or mixing up singular and plural or anything like that. So for those of you who English is not your mother tongue, congratulations and well done. Toastmasters is helping you all to grow your English skills. Understanding that I live in a country where we have 11 official languages. And whilst English is widely spoken in business, it isn't, isn't the main language spoken at home by most people in South Africa. So the use of deem, very well done. A lot of people did use it. Some of them more than once or twice. Graham used it, Paulina used it, Martin used it, Nicolina used it. In most instances, it was used correctly, but the winner today was definitely Linda. Linda used it more than a couple of times. Congratulations, Linda. Well done. <laughs> Thank you. Looking to um, some of the other language, De uh, Graham's speech was sprinkled with fabulous phrases and um, and words. He talked right in the very beginning about the pinnacle of achievement. That was fantastic. He talked about disparaged. He also used alliteration and triads pretty well. Look west, western weaponry, western weaponry. Listen, listen, listen. He said collective, collaborative. I think the third one was cohesive. Very good alliteration there, and as I mentioned, triads. As did David, also used quite a few triads. Match after match after match. And David, you can rest assured, when I was a, a young teenager, I was also watching Illy Nastasia with my parents on a black and white television. You talked about wonderful, 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 the Beatles, the Stones and Zeppelin, my gang of friends. But you started out and really caught our attention with a beautiful phrase, peering out of my window, not looking out the window, peering out my window, which those kind of words always add to fabulous stories. Nikita in her table topics also had some fantastic words. I'm not sure what that thesis she was doing or that doctoral studies that she's doing is about at the moment. It has escaped me for the minute, but her thesis will definitely contain some fabulous words. She talked about dialectic, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, synthesis uh, mutual recognition, integral, Lovely words used again, but all in all, the use of language in this club was absolutely fantastic. And thank you very much, Leisha, for the opportunity to join me, join you this afternoon. Over to you, Madam Toastmaster. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nikki. Very, very nice and profound report. And let's move on to our A counter, Volodymyr. Uh, the stage is yours, Volodymyr Ukrainis, Super Health Club. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, today my report will be short because we have only four people who has clutch works among those who, and uh, by the way, you, Polina, are also among those four who has clutch works because you have su such an amount and even the same clutch works as Lesia, one, um, and two, air. And unfortunately, we have the recordsman of clutch works. It's our president, Eric. He has uh, two A. Uh, nine um two a eh, and uh, six you know and the uh, chris one um and one you know thank you for your attention all the others without clutch words nice thank you so much Vladimir. and i guess for such a long meeting it's a tremendous result so well done everyone thank you and let's move on to our timers report and i welcome on this stage natalia Valier. Hi everyone. I'm super happy that we are on time with this meeting and I would like to just to read the times for you for the speeches and table topics and relations. So Graham, 12 minutes, 41 seconds, 
thank you for letting me know for the 30 minute speech. David, thank you for letting me know for 11 minute speech and you did 11.36, almost on time. For the table topic sessions, Nikolai, first time a one minute, eight seconds, then 27 seconds, then later um, uh, one minute for uh, 34 seconds. And Natalia Porubocha, uh, two minutes, 18 seconds. Martin, two minutes, uh, 14 seconds. Alicia, one minute, 25. Colin, one minute, 23. Linda, one minute, 21. Uh, Nikita, 235. Vera, 237. Uh, David, two minutes sharp. Uh, brilliant time. Lesia, one minute, 40, uh, 57. Almost brilliant time. Serhii, one minute, 40, uh, uh, 43. Evaluation, uh, Linda's evaluation of grand speech is uh, three minutes, uh, 17 seconds. Then Timur with his evaluation, four minutes, eight seconds. Uh, Eric with uh, evaluation of table topics, we had 12 people participating and Nikolai participated three times, so even more. Uh, and Eric took 10 minutes and 28 seconds to, for the evaluation, could be a little bit shorter. Um, that's still good. And Nikki, four minutes and three seconds. Thank you for all of this. Have a wonderful day. Thank you so much, Natalia. Very structured and condensed report. Thank you so much. And today we have also the general evaluator's role to evaluate the entire meeting, how we are doing in terms of the complete Toastmasters meeting. And I'm happy to welcome on this virtual stage, Sandra Theodore, DTM from Genesis One Toastmasters Club. Please welcome. Thank you, Madam Toastmaster of the meeting. First of all, I want to apologize for not showing my camera. Unfortunately, uh, I don't know what's happening. I've been, been bumped out of the meeting several times and now I can't show my camera. So um, I beg your apologies for that. President of this club, uh, the executive members, fellow Toastmasters from all over the world. I am Sandra Tedo, distinguished Toastmaster Sandra Tedo from District 81 in the Caribbean. I belong to Genesis One, and I'm here today to give the general evaluators report. You know, all the roles that you perform in a Toastmasters meeting, you develop certain skills as the general evaluator. The skills that you, you know, develop are those of critical thinking, planning, preparation, organization, time management, motivation, and team building. This evening, I'm going to talk generally about how this meeting went. Uh, to me, looking at everyone, you seem very comfortable in your spaces. All of our guests were warmly welcomed, including myself. And by uh, Toastmaster Lisa and also the president. The meeting opened precisely three minutes after the hour. The Toastmaster of the meeting did an excellent job. She interjected in between speeches and gave great tips on the power of habit. We had two great speeches with varying styles. I deem Graham the historian and David the storyteller. I enjoy both of them. In terms of the table topics, Kim Nicolina gave some great questions, and I deem them great anyway, with equally great answers. I thought, though, that I don't know, but this is just my opinion, that she would really base her questions on the theme of the meeting and get people thinking in terms of that. However, great questions. Uh, Nikolai, Natalie, Martin, Colin, Alicia, Linda, Akita, Vera, Daphne, Chris, David, they all gave great answers. Nikolai, I, I, I wondered if you're a new Toastmaster. I want to commend you. Usually people shy away from answering the table topics, but you jumped in, I think, on three occasions to answer. Toast, Table topics is an important part of Toastmasters. We call it speaking impromptu. And as a Toastmaster, you, you, there's the, the saying, it's better, better listening, better thinking, better speaking. And it helps with your organizational skills, okay? In terms of uh, our evaluators, unfortunately, I was, uh, thrown out of the meeting when Linda and Eric 
were speaking, so I didn't quite get uh, your evaluations. I got the beginning of Linda's and I got the ending of, 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 of um, the other evaluator, Richard. Eric, excellent. I deem you the table topics evaluator of the year. <laughs> imagine you had to evaluate all those speakers and i loved everything that you put forward for for the speakers uh, <clears throat> nikki as the grammarian i felt that you could have talked about pronunciation and word endings because there are a lot of persons in the room that are not uh, english speakers and it's very important to learn those things how to pronounce words and and, and the endings um, the timer well done our counter i did i think you missed somebody in in uh, our first speaker he he did use a lot of ahs and ums in his in his speech but very well done all in all i felt that this was a, a great meeting i enjoyed it tremendously being all the way from the caribbean it is now eight o'clock eight a.m my time <laughs> I was up at three, got the timing wrong <laughs> to come into the meeting, but I enjoyed your meeting. Back to you, Madam Tabletop, Toastmaster of the meeting. Thank you so much, Sandra. And thank you so much for your dedication into waking up this early. I'm, I'm really amazed by all the people that are staying up so early, I, or maybe somebody's late, but most of, the, most of you shared said that it was like very early morning. So thank you so much for your extra effort. And this concludes our agenda, our part of the official agenda. I'm happy to be in this amazing meeting. When, you know, honestly, when I saw the agenda, I, I knew that the meeting is deemed for success because it just was filled with so many great speakers, those masters, and I'm happy to be a part of this meeting today. And with that said, I would, would like to wish you to work in your habits, in, um, add the new ones, the good ones in your life, get rid of the ones that you would like to get rid of, and in overall, take, uh, take them one step at a, at a time. Thank you so much. And I pass the word to Anna Martina. Thank you. Valina, thank you very much uh, for being our Toastmaster today. As one of the organizers of this meeting, I would like to thank uh, all participants for joining us today. I would like to say thank you to our speakers for two marvelous speeches, which were very much to the point. The first one about uniqueness of Western civilization, which is about sharing information and about desire and ability to use it. And uh, I also would like to thank our second speaker about his amazing speech uh, that proves that there is always a room for a miracle in life, uh, of getting free tickets and of meeting with your hero in person. I would like to thank Nicolina uh, for conducting table topic session and for this takeaway that we can have about thinking how or what kind of bump sticker we'll create for ourselves because it is not about bump sticker about it is about how we identify ourselves so a lot of things uh, uh, that we can a lot of good things that we are taking for this meeting and i uh, we are very grateful uh, for everyone who came to join us today because not all of us, I mean, Ukrainians are able to talk, not all, all want to, to speak, but anyway, we feel involved and uh, we, uh, we can come and at least listen and to be with you and to be in a good company and it is very valuable for us. Thank you very much for your time and for your effort. And with this said, I would like to pass uh, the word to Lisa Yurchishin who will announce our next meeting. Thank you. Lessie, you're muted. Uh, hello, all. Actually, I am sure that uh, almost all, uh, <laughs> a lot of you are already signed up for uh, some roles and um, 
fill a Google form, which I sent um, actually before. Now I just thinking about how to um, like combine other efforts in um, giving information on the correct um, channel for you. And for this uh, purpose, actually, I uh, just wanted to, sh to show you that we will uh, usually have uh, like our website with all Google Calendar, if in case it's useful for you just to add this event to your Google Calendar. Also, we have uh, our Facebook page and all our nearest meeting are already posted there. So you just can go and also mark that you are willing to visit. Uh, also, we have Instagram page. We have uh, two actually Telegram chats, Telegram chats for Nipro Hills and for our talkers. And just a few days ago, I created WhatsApp chat in case it will be also uh, useful for you just to be in touch and uh, just to uh, go with all of us. Uh, all in all, uh, today I also made a recording. Uh, it's recording made it actually for um, all of us just in case you wanted to rewatch what we're talking about and for all those other members who uh, can't visit this but still wanted to be in uh, toastmasters mood i will put it into youtube channel and also will give you links in our official uh, post about it and uh, about our uh, nearest schedule uh, we already arrange a few workshops uh, i am um, very um, um, exuge, um, have to say it. I'm very passionate about all this workshop because I already have a chat with uh, the people who um, who willing to do this, and it really looks like it will be very very like extract of extract of everything. So I really encourage you to join to our workshops, and um, we uh, have it on 15th of May and uh, 11th of June. Additionally, after workshop, we will have table topic session and all of you can also take part and be um, uh, active impromptu speaker. And also we planned uh, like full agenda meeting. It's meeting uh, where we have like uh, two or three prepared speeches, table topic session, all technical team and all of you are uh, really welcome. Uh, Zoom link for all of this meeting will be the same and also time start will be the same. Uh, I hope all of today's um, um, time in from uh, 6 a.m. to 6, 6 p.m. was uh, 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 for all of us and we can uh, like join it all. And all in all, in case you still wanted to have some uh, emails reminding from us via email, because I know that for some people it's also very significant, just put your email and I will be know that uh, one day before meeting, I will just <laughs> send you a letter and will come again <laughs> to our meeting. So uh, again, thanks for being with us. Thanks for all your uh, support and help and all your readiness, I feel. Uh, how many of you are with us these days and even after actually we close the agenda on uh, Thursday evening and on Friday and then Saturday I received uh, six another letters with asking um, that maybe you need my help I am <laughs> I'm here to help you it's it's really very very um, uh, touching and I give the stage to our president Eric for closing the meeting and we also usually have some small after party talks of uh, up to 30 minutes if you still wanted to share something you are ready to this uh, so Eric please <laughs> your, 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 your turn <laughs> Well, I, I don't think there's much left to say. I think you, you covered it all. I, I really appreciate everybody's contributions in here. And again, just the size of the audience. Uh, I think somebody remarked they thought this was, a, you know, an awards uh, ceremony, <laughs> something like that, you know, um, because of the, the size. So I know everybody wants to um, be in contact, be involved. And that's why we're starting up uh, some of these meetings uh, to, to share and uh give people some opportunity to express feelings, emotions, and that too throughout, and uh, world community support is really great. So um, I think the only last thing to do is we will try to get ourselves a photo. Who's going to do it? Alicia, can you grab the photos here? If we yeah, do. Okay, so we need everybody to turn their cameras on for those that can. I know maybe some issues with that, but if you can. Um, 
and give a, a nice smile for Alicia here. Okay, all right, great. Thank you all. So uh, we're gonna have a little bit of after party here and just general discussion, but I declare this meeting closed uh, from official standpoint and uh, tell us all what you thought and uh, what, what else do you wanna chat about?